thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, the remarks I'm going to be making today are a follow-up to a talk that I gave earlier this week here at the talk. I'll begin with a very quick summary of the argument that I made several days ago, and then pick it up there and try and show how we might do what I'm proposing ought to be done. Okay? In that sense, I see myself largely as a messenger uh, carrying a message to various countries that I've been invited to give talks to. Messages that are, number one, completely obvious, and number two, completely ignored. And I think in part they're ignored because those of us in the legal profession aren't quite sure how to go about tackling the problem. And what I'm prepared to talk about today is ways in which I have uh, come up with that will, I think, uh, if implemented in various countries, for all the differences between your country and mine, for instance, and their legal systems, I think there are methods for tackling the problem I'm talking about that would work equally well in both places. You may be able to tell me I'm wrong. It wouldn't work in Mexico at all, but we'll see how that goes. Um, should I hold forth for about an hour or less? Less. 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 How much time? 14, 14 minutes? No. 30 minutes? Thirty minutes? No more than twenty. <laughs> if you want to, to have a you uh, really read the page. Yeah. So there are twenty minutes to thirty minutes. No, twenty minutes tops. Twenty minutes tops. Okay, so I'll go till ten forty five. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then discussion. And then we can discuss. And Black questions. Box. And if I'm, if something I say is unclear, uh, for heaven's sakes, feel free to interrupt me and I'll try to clarify it. Okay. 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 Thank you. The message in question is, is simply this, that the legal system, the criminal justice system in particular, is meant to be a form of inquiry. It aims at figuring out whether the defendant, the accused, did or did not commit the crime or the crimes that he is charged with. Okay. There is a difference, however, and how we go about answering that question. Because there is a legal answer to that question, and there's what I call a material or a factual answer to that question. Right. The legal answer is, did the evidence presented in the trial against this person reach the threshold of proof necessary to persuade the judge, if it's a trial by judge, to persuade the judge that it's a prueba plena or a prueba mas allá de una duda razonable, a very high standard of proof. Okay? And if that is not satisfied, then of course the defendant will be found, depending on the country, innocent or not guilty or guilt not proven. Right. There's a whole different range of things, but basically let, I'll use the word acquittal to talk about that kind of thing. <laughs> That, however, is very different, obviously, from asking the question, is it rational to believe that the defendant committed the crime? If the answer to that question, in light of the evidence, whatever evidence is available, is yes, then I will say that he is materially guilty, whether he's legally guilty or not. Right? Suppose the likelihood that he committed the crime is 80%. That's not going to be enough to satisfy the standard of proof he will almost certainly not be convicted. But it is likely enough for us to say the rational thing to believe is that he probably is the culprit, that he's probably guilty. <clears throat> okay? Move from there to the question, which is the main question I want to raise. <clears throat> How frequently do errors occur in trials? I do not mean procedural errors. I don't mean cases where the judge misinterpreted a bit of the Codigo process. The errors that I'm focused on are errors of fact. That is to say, if a person is found legally guilty, 
but in fact did not commit the crime, that is a very egregious error. We call it a false conviction, and that's the appropriate label for it. Then there's the false acquittal, where someone is acquitted, but in fact did commit the crime. Those are, as far as I'm concerned, the two most important errors that can occur in a criminal procedure. Convicting a defendant who did not commit the crime and acquitting a defendant who actually did commit the crime. If we have any confidence at all in how the criminal justice system works, and this is true with any other system of inquiry too, we need to know something about the frequency with which that system of inquiry makes errors. You wouldn't think of accepting a report from your doctor that he's just given you a certain test and the test has found that you have condition X. You wouldn't accept that unless the doctor could tell you how reliable that test is as a diagnostic tool for determining whether someone has disease X, right? You would be very dissatisfied with the doctor who would tell you, here are your test results, and I haven't any idea how reliable they are. That would make medicine a joke, a comedy, or a tragedy more likely. There is no area of inquiry that I'm aware of that does not, apart from the criminal justice system, that does not take serious steps, not only to find out how many errors it makes, but to break down that form in terms of false positives and false negatives. And more than that, it seeks to identify, once it has found an error, here's the kind of questions I want to ask. Once an error has been found, we need to ask ourselves what caused that error. Which procedural rule or set of procedural rules led to that mistaken judgment, that erroneous verdict? Because if we can't find what rules were responsible for a mistake that has been made or a series of mistakes that have been made, then there is no element of self-correction in the law. And again, self-correction is a a necessary condition for any adequate system of inquiry. You have to be able to learn from your mistakes. That's, as I said, about as obvious as one can put anything. Does a legal system learn from its mistakes? In general, no, because in general it doesn't know which mistakes it has made because it invests very little time in trying to figure out what material errors were made. I know no country, no country, but there may be one that has missed my my examination, but I'm aware of no country where there is (coughs) routine reports about how frequently the courts convict people who are innocent. How frequently they acquit people who are guilty. Even when, as in the United States, some efforts have been made to try and figure out how many false convictions there are, there's been almost no steps taken to try and figure out, well, what caused those mistakes? Was it this rule procedure, that rule? Because if you can't figure out which rule or rules cause the mistakes that have been made, you can't make changes in the rules that will reduce the frequency of mistakes. Right? A robust system of inquiry is one where, A, you figure out what mistakes you made insofar as you can. Number two, you figure out what part of the existing rule structure is responsible for those mistakes. Number three, you propose a change of those rules, then you have good reason to think will produce that kind of mistake less frequently. Okay? 
That's not just my view of what a system of inquiry looks like. That's what that's the view of almost everybody who talks about inquiries, especially since the time of Charles Sanders Peirce, with the emergence of this idea that a genuine system of empirical research has to be self-corrective. It has to be such that it can identify its mistakes and can remedy those mistakes. There's a very famous phrase in Peirce, which I think ought to be applied to the law as much as it is, in many cases, to the sciences. The phrase that Peirce made was, and this is why he thought science was a great tool for research, if science leads us astray, more science will set us straight, says Peirce. That is, it has a capacity to correct itself and identify the mistakes that it's made. Right. I'm basically propounding the line that we ought to try and devise checks on the legal system that enable us to do the same kind of thing with the legal system that we expect to be done in every <coughs> other form of empirical res research. Namely, an earnest look for the errors that have been made, a serious attempt to identify which rules are responsible for those errors, errors and a commitment to make changes in the error-producing rule that are less likely to lead to mistakes. Okay, that was basically my argument of the other night. Now I'm going to pick up that argument and talk in a good deal more detail about how on earth we might go about this very difficult task of figuring out how many false convictions are made, how many false acquittals are made, in figuring out which regulus processalis are responsible for those mistakes, and the most challenging thing of all, how can we replace the existing rules that do make too many mistakes with rules that are less likely to produce erroneous verdicts? That's going to be my focus for today. Uh, that said, let me. Uh, direct your attention to this handout that has all the numbers on it. I don't want to bore you with the numbers. I certainly don't want to pretend that the numbers like this apply to the Mexican legal system. I'm sure they're very different in Mexico than they are in the US. But what I want to do is to illustrate how one might go about making law a respectable form of inquiry by taking the numbers seriously and in effect suggesting that if you find reasonably persuasive the analysis that I'm going to be giving in the next few minutes, then there might be room for and pressure for trying to put pressure on the authorities to allow the collection of the kind of data that is necessary in Mexico in order to be able to answer questions like how frequently are false convictions, how frequently do false acquittals occur, and which rules were involved in the occurrence of those mistakes. I'll draw your attention very quickly to the American situation. Uh, these data all come from 2008. They deal entirely with violent crimes. In the US, a violent crime is either a murder, a rape, an aggravated assault, or an armed robbery. This does not address the question of other crimes. It may well be that there are very different patterns of error for minor crimes than for major crimes like these. But just to paint for you a picture of how grim the situation is in the United States, we know that in 2008, and it was not an atypical year, it was fairly common of recent years, there were 1.7 million victims of violence. Of those, approximately 850,000 <coughs> victims reported the crime to the police. That is, roughly half of the victims of violent crimes let the police know that they've been victimized. So that's one problem. The next move is, once the police heard about it, they obviously went out and tried to solve the crime. That produced approximately, as you see in the next slide, 600,000 arrests. So about one in three crimes lead to an arrest. Okay. 
Moving on from there, skipping down the page, 253,000 of the crimes that were reported to the police went completely unsolved. The police solved 595,000 of the 850,000 reported to them. Okay, so obviously one place where the errors are occurring is with respect to this gap between the number of crimes reported and the success of the police in solving those crimes. But my main concern is not so much with errors at this preliminary level, but with errors that begin to creep into the system once there is a set of people who have been arrested for a crime and charged with the crime. That's where my focus is. In the United States, there are three, and this year, there were 363,000 people convicted of a violent crime. That is about one in six of the people who committed violent crimes. Okay, so five out of every six people who commit a violent crime never get arrested and uh, never get convicted. The convictions break down in two parts. Of the 363,000 people who were convicted, right, barely 10%, namely 30,000 of them, are convicted by trial by jury. The rest, the 333,000 convictions, emerge from plea bargains. In short, trial by jury is a, the, almost the vanishing point in the United States. And that uh, may be good, it may be bad, but it is an inevitable trend that grows where the proportion of convictions that are due to plea bargains gets larger and larger and larger every year. Okay. That means, by the way, if we want to get clear about the frequency of false convictions and false acquittals and what their causes are, we have to break our research down into two different tracks. What are the factors that go on in a plea bargaining situation? How, what is the frequency of errors associated with plea bargaining? <laughs> and the same set of questions for trials by jury. It may, I suspect it will come as a huge surprise to you to know that the fairly extensive studies that people like I have been doing, the so-called innocence projects in the United States have been doing, make it clear that for those people who go to trial and are convicted, approximately 3% of the convictions are false convictions. In other words, the other 97% are legitimate, true convictions. The studies of pleas, however, well, may I ask for a show of hands? What would you guess was the ratio, was the proportion of errors in trials by, by in, in um, convictions by plea as opposed to convictions by trial. Most people, at least most lawyers in the United States, would say, oh Lord, um, it's got, plea bargaining has to lead to far more errors than trials by jury do. Um, sorry, it doesn't work out that way. Such data as we have indicate that plea bargains yield 0.1% false convictions compared to 3% false convictions for trials by jury, which is going to cause every American judicial thinker to scratch his head and wonder what on earth is going on, because the popular folklore about plea bargaining is that there's plenty of prosecutorial misconduct, intimidation, threatening and so forth and so on. I don't dispute that that goes on. What I find kind of astonishing and hard to get around is that of all the groups that have tried to study the problem of how often the false convictions happen, right? there is no group that hasn't found that the proportion of false convictions is much lower in plea bargaining situations than it is in Trials by jury. <coughs> and any event, the act of, yeah. I'm sorry, just, I was wondering whether there's a factor of race playing in, in those numbers. 
does the, do your investigation take into account race regarding plea bargaining and um, uh, conviction by trial? Uh, not the data that I presented yeah. you. But do you there is it? data that I've put together um, concerning uh, the race question. What What is true is the following, namely that if you look at criminal victimization studies, and these are done quite well in the United States every year, 800,000 households are interviewed by people from the Census Bureau, asked if any member of this household was the victim of a crime during the preceding year. Mm. If the answer to that question is yes, then an expert interviewer is sent by the Census Bureau to get as many details from that victim as they can. What was the roughly the age of the perpetrator? What was the ethnicity? What was the gender of the perpetrator? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Was it in daylight? Was it nighttime? So forth and so on. These results are published annually. You can download them from the internet. That's how I get the number that I state at the top of this about the number of victims, the 1.7 million victims. That number arises not from police work at all, but from work by the census, by the census. trying to get an idea of how frequently various types of crimes happen. Okay, now with respect to the racial question, it turns out that there are the likelihood that a, let's, let's focus on young men because that is where criminal uh, violent crimes are concerned. But it's the focus in terms of if you're worried about the perpetrators. Something like 40% of all American violent crimes come from men in the ages of 15 to 28. Mm -hmm. right? And that is out of all proportion to their share of the population. That is the age of criminality, at least in the United States. That's when it peaks. And then it begins to fall off in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, very dramatically. So that recidivism and seriality and criminality are, are things that eventually go away. It's not the case that if someone was a serial felon when he was 18, that he's likely to be one when he's 52. There's very powerful evidence that there is a dropping off of the frequency. Now what does this have to do with the, the question about black, black America? What is true is, number one, that there are more blacks arrested for violent crimes in the United States per capita than there are whites arrested per capita. Mm. What's also true is that if you look at the victimization reports, where the victims indicate the race or the ethnicity of the perpetrator, the numbers of black perpetrators are much higher the proportion of black perpetrators are much higher than their proportion in the population. So you've got three cases where there might appear to be forms of discrimination. Namely, the police are arresting somebody. They're arresting a lot more blacks than they arrest whites. Number two, in trials, a, a black person is more likely to be convicted mm -hmm. than a white person. Mm -hmm. Now it's important that that point be stated carefully. It's not true that the proportion of black defendants who are convicted is higher than the proportion of white defendants who are convicted. Rather it is that the proportion of blacks convicted and the proportion of whites convicted right, reflect the victimization information about how many perpetrators, according to the victims, fall into one of these two ethnic groupings. Okay. Mm. And therefore, what we should expect is that proportionally, there's a higher arrest rate for black young men than there is for white young men, because the victims are reporting the numbers to us, and they indicate that there's about, it's th about three times more likely that a black will perpetrate a violent crime. Mm. That it, let me put it different. About three times more likely that a violent crime will be perpetrated by a black person than a white person. Mm. And the really sad thing about it is, if you look at victimhood, overwhelmingly, 
blacks are victims of violent crimes at a vastly higher rate in the United States than um, whites are. Mm. And most crimes in America are what are called intra-racial, not inter-racial. 80% right? mm. of black people, when men and women who were murdered, are murdered by right. their fellow blacks. Mm. And uh, about 70% of whites who are murdered are murdered by their fellow whites. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that, that's yes. not a full-fledged answer, but it's a stab at it. So I've only got five minutes. Oh, wow, well, my goodness. Uh, wow. Um, let's move on quickly. I want to suggest to you that, roughly speaking, and you can see this on the next sheet of paper. The number of false convictions, false positives, in the year 2008 for violent crimes was approximately 11,000 people were falsely convicted. By contrast, there were about 95,000 people falsely acquitted. In other words, there's more than eight false acquittals for every false conviction. Okay. Now, if you're a follower of William Black's film, you might say, well, that's not so bad, because you know I think that false convictions are 10 times more costly than false acquittals. So the figures that are appearing in the United States, 8.3 to 1, that's not very far off, 10 to 1, um, it looks like everything's going OK. No, it's not. And the reason it's not is because Blackstone's number of 10 to 1 was a number arbitrarily pulled out of a hat and for which no argumentation was ever given by him or by anybody else in the history of the law that I'm aware of. You will know that the guesses that have emerged in the history of law about this question uh, have there we go. Here's a few examples. Maimonides, a very long time ago, said that what we should expect if the justice system is fair is 10, is 1,000 false acquittals for every false conviction. Right? Even Aquinas was kind of a Then William Blackstone came along in the 18th century and said, no, 10 to 1 is a good ratio. He had no arguments whatsoever. Why should it be 10 to 1 instead of 30 to 1, 2 to 1? Speaking of two to one, Voltaire, Blackstone's contemporary, proposed a two to one. His view was that a false conviction is twice as bad as a false acquittal. But he didn't give any arguments for why not. So. And finally, there was the American politician and inventor, Benjamin Franklin, who chimed in in the late 18th century and said, no, the ratio should be 100 to one. OK. Not a one of these has the slightest rationale, I'm sorry to say, at least not given by its proponents. And therefore, if we're concerned not only with reducing error, but as I think is just as important, making sure that errors are distributed in a way that realistically reflects their respective costs, then what we need to do is do empirical research on how costly is a false equivalent in the case of a violent crime case. <clears throat> How costly is a false conviction? I have done that calculation. If I had more time, I'd talk to you about how, how, how I collected the data, but I don't have much time. Well, please, do tell us how did you collect the data. Uh, um, Details. Well, it's up to you. No, yeah. tell us. Yeah. It's up to me. Please do tell us. OK. <laughs> He's a dean, so three percent yes. uh, um, uh, false um, <laughs> right. conviction rate. So what what is the main source? So of three percent rate. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about the three percent rate. But remember, the three percent rate doesn't tell you anything about the cost of a false conviction. Mm -hmm. It only tells you about the frequency of a false mm -hmm. conviction, mm -hmm. and those are two very different yes. issues. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So, you want to hear from me about the cost or about the frequency? <laughs> the cost. Both, both, both. Both, both, yes. Both, all right. As the quickly data, as, data. as I can. Um, <laughs> as near as I can ascertain, and that is contained on this sheet that you have in front of you, page two, mm -hmm. you'll see that the false conviction rate <laughs> up here. Yes, the, there are 11,000 false convictions out of 360,000 false convictions. Sorry, 360,000 convictions. That turns out to be 3%. Okay, now you might ask, well, how do we know that there's 11,000 people who were falsely convicted? I'll talk about that in a minute. As for the other number, what we have is 94,000 people, I estimate, in this sample were acquitted but were factually guilty of the crime in question. That's roughly speaking a 38 to 40 percent false acquittal rate. Okay. Now, how did I get those data? But I want to stress that answering that question is only answering half of the key question we need to ask because we have to know both what is the frequency of these mistakes and what is the cost associated with each of these mistakes. Because until we know the answer to that question, we don't know, A, how to set the standard in order to produce a distribution of errors that reflects their actual costs. That's what ideally a standard of proof should do. Right? It should produce a proportion of errors such that the more expensive the error among the two, the less frequent it is. Okay? But the other thing we have to do, obviously, is to figure out the cost of those errors in order to be able to figure out how high to set the standard of proof before that standard of proof can guarantee that we will have a ratio of errors that correspond with the what we have judged as the respective values of the two. All right, but to your, uh, your question initially, how do we decide that there was a 3% false conviction rate? <clears throat> Most of that work was not done by the courts. The courts never do any research of this kind, unfortunately, and that is a disgrace in my view. In the United States, it's been done predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly by this movement called the Innocence Projects. Practically every law school in the United States, as you may know, now has an Innocence Project that it is funding. What this Innocence Project does is to circulate the letter to all the people currently in prison in the state where that Innocence Project is located. And it says, if you believe or you know that you did not commit the crime and you have any evidence of your innocence apart from the evidence that was presented at trial, please meet with our researchers, our attorneys. They will talk to you and if they are persuaded that yes, you do have exculpatory evidence that was not considered at the crime, at the trial, and we will request, in effect, a retrial for you. It's technically called an exoneration hearing. The exoneration hearing works in the following way. The judge, at the beginning, asks to see what new evidence have you got that might indicate that you weren't guilty and that you were innocent. The defendant presents that evidence to the judge. The judge may say simply, in my opinion, this would not change the verdict in any significant way. On the other hand, if the judge is impressed that this is pertinent and exculpatory evidence, then he will have a call a hearing where there's a prosecutor, there's a defense attorney, and the question at issue is when all the evidence, both the evidence admitted at trial and the new evidence produced by the defendant is considered together, is it the case that there is a reasonable doubt now 
about the defendant's guilt, whereas there was not mm -hmm. in his previous trial. Mm -hmm. And if there is basis for a reasonable doubt, what happens? Well, of course, he is exonerated. He is let out of prison. He is given a payment of approximately $40,000 a year for every year that he was erroneously in prison. Okay? Now, the trouble with the Innocence Project approach is that what they do is a very good thing. Namely, they say, if all the evidence is considered, this person should have been acquitted. I agree with that. But they also draw the conclusion that, oh, well, these are truly innocent people. And of course, that's not a warranted inference to draw at all. The fact, the finding that emerges at the exoneration hearing, namely that the guilt of the defendant is lower than the threshold of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that does not establish that he did not commit the crime. Suppose, for instance, his apparent guilt with the new evidence is 80%. Now, that's going to lead the court to say, oh, well, we have to throw, overthrow your conviction. But that doesn't mean it's being overthrown because the court believes that he did not commit the crime. If, if the court concludes that the likelihood of the defendant's guilt is 80%, he, in fact, believes that the defendant did commit the crime. Right? That's what, it, if there's any proposition that you're entertaining that you think is 80% true, then that's what you have a rational duty to believe, right? So the exoneration numbers don't tell us very much about the truly innocent and the truly guilty. What has made a dramatic difference is the emergence of DNA evidence. There's a wonderful, pair of studies done by Michael Weisinger, who's an a evidence law professor at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, in which what he does, because he's as suspicious as I am of the regular exoneration here as an instrument for finding out who's really innocent and who isn't. What he did, and it happened at a time, a very fortunate time in history, that gave him evidence that people don't usually have. In about 1992, American courts began introducing, allowing the admission of DNA evidence. And as you know, DNA evidence has a very, very high probability, a very, very high reliability. Now, I'm sorry, 1992? Huh? 1992? 1992. Yes, that was the first time they they allowed DNA evidence to be admitted at trial. Before that, there could be blood evidence, but not DNA evidence. What, Reese, what Reisinger did was to look at people who had been convicted of either rape or murder in the 10 years immediately before 1992. He looked at all the cases from New York State, from the state of New Jersey, <laughs> he had a fairly good sample of about 500 um, cases of people convicted of rape and murder, or rape or murder, but usually it was both. What he did was to collect from all of those people who'd been convicted and were in jail, he collected DNA evidence from them and sent it to a laboratory for analysis to see whether that DNA evidence corresponded with the traits of the bodily fluids that had been collected by the police in association with the crime of rape or murder. And what Reisinger found was that approximately 3.5% of all the cases from New York and New Jersey in the preceding 10 years that had led to a conviction for rape or murder or both about 3% of those cases, in fact, involved defendants who were genuinely innocent in that there was not a DNA match between the bodily fluids that had been retained from those trials and the bodily fluids of the person who was currently in prison. 
I find that kind of evidence much more compelling than an exoneration here. And as I said, his figure is about 3.8. Now, what he doesn't do is to look at any cases that involve um, plea bargain. He looks only at jury trials. Okay. And the reason why I'm inclined to scale his estimate back slightly from his 3.8% to my 3% is that we have a lot of evidence that the frequency of false convictions in plea bargaining is much lower than it is in trial by jury. And especially since nine out of every ten convictions emerges from a plea bargain rather than from, from a trial. So I, and Reisinger agrees with this slight emendation down from 3.8 to 4 point, to, to uh, 3%. But the, you can see how one might go about doing it. If you, particularly if you have a change in the forensic tools available in the years immediately after their introduction, one can go back and look at the data when those tools were not available, and you can make a judgment as to how much the admission of this new form of evidence, in this case DNA, did to reduce the frequencies of error that subsequently occurred. You're not in your head as if you are in disagreement. 